So when I grew up as a young boy, we lived in a residential area across the road from a tennis club. And so from a young age, sport was something that was enjoyable for me. So I got into tennis very early and, and I'd try and rush through my homework, get all my chores done so I could get over and spend two, three hours a day playing tennis next door. I fell in love with the game and I, and, I, and I loved doing it. And obviously I had an advantage because I was a big kid. So I was tall and strong at a young age. So um, I sort of got better and better, but unfortunately I kept growing into this body. And uh, there are not too many 120 kilogram uh, Wimbledon champions. But my journey out of tennis actually only came when I went to high school. The thing that made me choose to move away from tennis, other than the fact that I was growing out of the game, uh, was the fact that I just enjoyed the team sports more. I enjoyed the people and working with people and being in, in that sort of environment of camaraderie and working together. So, um, and this body was more suited to rugby than it was to tennis. For me, it was quite an interesting time because I was almost born of a generation that was almost too young to really understand the intricacies of apartheid. I was probably eight years old, nine years old, and I remember driving home from church on a Sunday in, in a little town called Boxburg. And we got stopped, you know, because there was an AWB sort of meeting happening at the dam. And my dad had to make an excuse of, to get us, almost get us through to go home, that he was gonna come back, you know, so that he would let, at, least, at least let us through. And that was sort of the first sort of, only thing I could really remember from that time, and I was young. And obviously our democracy went ballistic, you know, obviously in 94 with the elections and that leading up to the release of, of, of Madiba as well. And I was fortunate at the time because in 1994 I was 16 years old and all of this was happening right in front of me. I went to a school, Petro Boys High, that was already multiracial even before the election. I mean, I was part of the generation that had to learn how to change our national anthem. We had to learn a new national anthem at the age of 15, 16, you know. And so we'd have 1,500 boys coming together on a Friday morning to, to learn the new national anthem um, and watch Madiba become the first pr president of color in a country like that. And, and uh, I guess my pathway into what I did, ended up doing for a living, Captain South Africa, um, you know, thrust me into a very young democratic country um, that was, you know, for me, booming in terms of what could have happened um, with the change. The Springboks, literally, they, de they sort of determine the mood of the country, really. It's just how big rugby is in South Africa. And for us, the World Cup was an, an amazing thing. Just to host it was amazing. And um, the fact that we got through the final, uh, one of my really good mates got me a ticket. So we actually caught a lift from Pretoria to Johannesburg to watch the final at Ellis Park. And I'll never forget the Boeing coming right over our heads um, on the day of the final and then watching that go into extra time and then winning that game. I mean, we couldn't get back to Pretoria. The, the, the city was jammed. And so there was this unbelievable party. And I think even South Africans don't quite understand the magnanimity of that actual the whole thing unfolding with Madiba. I mean, we had, a, we had a difficulties leading up to that World Cup because you know, all the people of color saw the Springbok emblem as, a, you know, as the enemy. And um, Madiba had an opportunity to, 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 to use that against, I suppose, the, cha the, the past of South Africa. But he saw this as part of the, what a, a man does who's jailed for 27 years and comes out and forgives everyone and tries to figure out ways to bring them together. And he saw the Springbok as now a past symbol of um, apartheid to become a symbol of bringing people together. And so he'd go to his rallies for the months leading up to the World Cup wearing a Springbok hat. And in the first couple of rallies, he'd be booed by his people until eventually he started to explain to them that we all needed to be together to be under, you know, to support one team. I don't think we'll ever know that, that they have the power of what that did. When they started chanting his name, remembering even in 95, there's still a predominantly white South African crowd watching that final. Chanting the words Nelson you know, in, a, in a stadium like that is, is, is insane. <laughs> Our journey to 2007 was, was, a, was really a four-year one uh, with a lot of highs and a lot of lows um, and a lot of lessons along the way. I think what we started, we started with a very young group of guys that really just, they just wanted to play for South Africa and get the honour of that, that badge and that jersey back. The basis really was on creating an environment, a family and working hard to resurrect what needed. we wanted to be the best rugby team in the world again. 
things happened quite quickly for us. I think with a bit of luck, we we, we won some pretty close games and, and won a Tri Nations, and then the sort of confidence level of that team grew substantially. And um, throughout the time, we were fortunate and we had a group of people that were good, good human beings, and that was really key because when the tough times come, that's normally when there's. You know, there's Fractions in a group and these sort of splits in camps and that kind of thing and and all the bumps that we in, endured um, brought us closer and closer together. I mean, if I think back in 2006, we lost six games in a row. We came this close to being fired and dropped. A, a coach gone, captain gone, a year out from winning the World Cup, and that's the, I guess the key differences or the small moments or the, the little inches that make uh, you know, the, the difference. The key thing for me was to turn our diversity into a strength, to embrace it. You know, we, we could uh, respect each other's uh, cultures, backgrounds, colours, languages, and, and let the team, I guess, protect from all of the, the people that didn't embrace diversity. So for, for us, the, the key thing for me as the leader of that group was to try and mix all these people in. And bearing in mind, I had a lot of strong leaders within that group. I had Victor Matfield, Jean de Villiers, Skulkberger, Juan Smith, Frieda Priya, Skulkberger, all these guys that could have been captain as well. And so I needed them to see the same picture and support the whole process. And that meant sitting at a different table every morning. That meant, you know, understanding uh, the difference in cultures. I once had a player come into my room who'd been playing unbelievably well in, in, in his first year, making the Springboks starting lineup and in the second year you know he wasn't quite making it he came to my room and he said what more must I do you know I was a spring back I was starting and now I'm on the bench and you know what must I do I'm the fastest I'm the strongest I'm you know the most tackles you know and he was right but every single time he just said I everything was I and I said to him it's unfortunately in the team all those things that's the prerequisite that is the norm but can you tell me what is the coach's wife's name who are the guys that got dogs who likes to play golf who studies and he had no answers because he hadn't invested in the group. He hadn't taken the time out to respect the differences in his teammates and why some guys don't come to breakfast or why some guys on their off days go and study. You know, he didn't understand those things. And so he hadn't invested in, in, in his team and they in turn didn't invest in him. And I said to him, spend more time thinking about the people around you and they will start putting energy back into you. And that's what, what we created. That's what we created in that group. The mood of the country depends on the results of the Springboks on a Saturday and it sounds crazy but I promise you Monday morning the, how you arrive at work is dependent on what the Springboks did on the weekend, it's just a fact. And so you do have an unbelievable responsibility um, as, as ambassadors of hope for the country. You know, I think we've, we forget quickly about the past, but if you think about it, the gladiators of the past, I mean, they had to sacrifice a little bit more because you either won or you died um, at the entertainment of people. Uh, but now sportsmen, and specifically in South Africa, uh, you know, which, which is a country that's gone through so much change and we have an economy that's under pressure, you know, we have uh, so many issues that we are still getting working through. The thing that gives us hope is to put a shirt over our shoulders that's green and gold and escape reality for two hours while our heroes play for us and we all become Springboks together for 80 minutes against some of the world's best opposition. And in that 80 minutes, it doesn't matter how much petrol costs, how unhappy you are in your work, but you've got that two hours to escape. And so as ambassadors of hope, these Springboks, literally week in and week out, have to continue to pr produce the goods. And you know, you, you can go two ways. You can either see it as an unbelievable, you know, pressure building situation that disallows you from uh, expressing yourself as a team or you can see it as an unbelievable opportunity to bring happiness and hope and joy to millions of people. One of the things I'm proudest of is that everywhere I go and I, and I haven't captained the team since 2011 but people will call me captain and for me I think it's because we managed to embrace and represent the entire South Africa you know, while we were on this journey to winning the World Cup. P people underestimate the power that a Springbok team has over a country like that. So our responsibility is great and, uh, and when we understand it and embrace it, it has so much potential to bring happiness. The harder you try, the worse it gets. And often it's just because you, you don't have the ability to pull yourself out almost and look at it from the top and say, okay, you know, 
this is not going well, why? You know, It's your ability to perform under pressure, to make decisions, whether it's a actual phase where we just couldn't win a game, or whether it's an actual game where you've come in with a strategy that isn't working. And that strategy is like, the more you try it, the worse it gets because you, you sort of, you're, not, you're not adapting. And adaption for me is always key. You know, it's to understand it, have a, have a plan, have a strategy, and always make sure that if you're watching from the outside, and that you might need to put a plan B in place and have a plan B in your back pocket. I'll never forget, we always used to talk about the feeling in a change room after a test match that we'd lost that we shouldn't have. And you think to yourself, it feels terrible because you know you should have actually won this game. But you have to remember that feeling and how it feels so that you do everything in your power to avoid it. And what is that? It's to look at, at how to adapt and how to get better. And Because if you keep doing the same things over and over again, that's why the harder you try, the, the, the worse it gets because you're not doing anything different. The things that are making you fail, you're doing more of and so you're failing more. Everyone has an opinion and you've got to filter who you listen to. You know? Do you listen to the guy on the couch with, who's got 12 beers in him already? Uh, or do you listen to your coach who mentored you for 10 years that you know, calls you afterwards and says, you know, this is the story. You've got to pick who you listen to as well, understand, because you have to listen to what out, what's out there. And you also have to have the ability to pick what's good out there, you know, to, to, to be able to move forward. And every, every loss is a lesson. I like people, I like being around people. I like creating scenarios of, of groups where they, they embrace differences and enjoy each other you know? and I think that was probably my best skill as, as the captain of this group. It's a simple task really and, and it, all it just takes is, is a little bit of listening. If all you do is go to sleep early, wake up, have a protein shake, go train, have another sleep, have a good breakfast, go train to become the ultimate athlete, you don't have enough balance in your life to be able to make good decisions. And balance for me is being able to educate yourself, network into people, understanding different uh, facets of life. And it's, it's important from a decision making point of view because the more people you meet from different backgrounds, the more areas that you see, the more you learn, the, the, the better you become at making decisions. Every single guy that got married and had kids became better rugby players, became better decision makers because they started to think on behalf of other people not only about their kids, but as their role as a leader within the group, and they make better decisions. And so for me, the advice would be, create a life that has balance. Go and prepare your body and train hard and study in the same time, or you know, turn yourself into an entrepreneur. Find ways of creating balance in your life to make you better as a rugby player and as a, as a businessman. And so that when your paths start to come towards the end, this one just continues to pick you up and take you along the same path. It was pretty tough. I, <laughs> I was sitting on my couch, pretty much like this, watching TV in St Albans in our home while playing for Saracens. And uh, I'd just signed a deal to go to Toulon and play another two years in the south of France. And I, I, my phone rang and a guy called Stephen Saad, uh, yeah, he said, hi John, Stephen here, uh, I'm chairman of the Sharks board. He said, would you consider being CEO of the Sharks? I, and I genuinely thought I was being pranked by one of my mates. Uh, <laughs> So the first conversation didn't go down well. Anyway, he called back to verify that he was Stephen Saw, the chairman of the board. And um, this is quite a, quite a question to receive. As a rugby player, for the last four, 15 years, all you've done is play rugby. Um, and you get a call to be the CEO of a, a multi-million rand business slash brand. Um, that's so unbelievably important to you. That's pretty much given you most of what you've got out of rugby, you know, starting at the Sharks in 1997. So, Saying yes was quite challenging. I, I took on quite a bit of advice from those that I respected. Um, invariably, my mother was the one who said, obviously, you can do anything. I spent the first six months really just diving in and learning about how the business worked. It was a roller coaster ride because I had to listen a lot and learn a lot and, and understand, understand what made the business work, whereas the rugby side came easy. So where I started with the changes is that I made change to the rugby in terms of the things that I knew could, could have a, a, a proper difference, but I was quite patient on the, on the business side. On the business side, what I did is I just tried to work on the environment. And I walked into an office that was just a maze of little blocks of people hiding from each other, you know? And, and so I, you know, I introduced two rules immediately. I said, we are eventually gonna go open plan. And that was met with like, 
quite a lot of fear because people had been there for 15, 20 years, you know, in their little block, doing their thing, coming, going home. There was just no team environment. I started with two rules with my staff and, and bearing in mind it's the first time I've ever worked with women as well. So I had to learn a few of those lessons as well. And I just said from now on you can't email, that's, email anybody that's within a 20 meter radius of you and you can't have a meeting that's more than 20 minutes long. Um, and that just created a, a, a different outlook on themselves as a team and how they could possibly work together better. So it didn't go down well initially because it's just, for them it was inconvenient. But there's no better contact than actually tapping someone on the shoulder, talking, letting them hear your tone of voice, what your problem is, how they can help. An email can be so cold, you know, and also an email, if someone's sitting 20 meters from you, also tells another message, you know, that I don't have the time to actually come in, say hello, you know, maybe share this meeting over a cup of coffee. And 20 minutes is all you need to get a point across, and if you haven't, you haven't, you know, you haven't prepared well enough. And so these are the things that we started with. I created an open plan environment that has these rules that allows for people that are, are listening to a conversation on marketing who but they sit in finance but their husband might be in a, in a different business then they've heard something and all of a sudden you cross pollinate ideas and things just invariably sometimes you get a lot more out of a conversation because someone else is actually understanding what you're talking about. The key to this office is to actually smile when you drive in not when you drive out. I think sort of leadership sort of kept finding its way towards me. So I, I became a prefect at junior school and a, and, a, and a captain at high school and a head boy and, and these things kept following me. And um, with this leadership thrown at you at a young age, I think you start to you understand what the effect you, you, is that you have on a group when given the responsibility to lead them. And I think there's many different types of leaders. Some see the, the leadership as a reward for good behavior or performance. Um, and that's not necessarily the case for me. I, I see it as, as a responsibility of the group that you've been put in charge of. Remaining calm, I think, is one way of allowing your group to trust you. We had a coach once and he just got so nervous that you know we would be prepared. We would be better than the opposition and we'd have everything in place. And yet he would come into the change room before game and his eyes were big and he'd be shaking. And, and eventually, you know, everyone around was like, what are we missing here? I mean, they, you know, and I'd go to him and say, look, even if you have to pretend, just be calm. Because as a leader, he doesn't believe that we're going to be okay. We are in big trouble here. So it's important to have a, an understanding of the situation. I don't think there's any leader that's made a good decision when panicked because you just don't have the ability to think. You don't have the ability to adapt. I found the success in being able to change a situation that wasn't going well for us only came when I had the ability to calmly think about all the influencing factors currently. And that, as a captain of a rugby team, is to control the emotions of your team, to make them believe that there is a plan that's working, and if it's not working, that we'll find another plan that works in the next five minutes. And to calmly have an influence over the referee, who also in himself has got nerves and pressures building, and how you translate your calmness on him and how you influence him to make sure that you don't lose him throughout this bad patch as well. So you don't become a good rugby captain in your first year. People will say natural leaders are born, but you can become better at leading if, uh, if, if, you, if you apply yourself and you learn and, and you listen. For me, if you had to say one thing, I think the, the leaders we need are those that think less of themselves and more of those that they represent. I think it is one of the difficult things. I mean, I met my wife when we were 11. We started dating when we were 18 in, in our final year of school. And we got married when we were 26 and a half-ish. Had kids at 27 and a half-ish. And so my wife has been a rugby wife for 20 years. You know, so she's seen the world with me. She stopped seeing the world when we had kids. <laughs> uh, we now have three children and they're just at a magical age. And I, I tell you one thing, it's probably the one area where I haven't been able to create enough balance and I guess that's probably why you know, there will be a change in, in my life. You know, to do something like this in this field uh, it requires a certain amount of time and effort and that time and effort unfortunately doesn't provide enough balance for me to see these magical years. I've got a 10 year gap um, and so it's probably the one thing that I have failed at, of not being able to get the balance right between what I do for a living and watching my son bowl or my daughter shoot a hoop in netball and um, I guess that's something that, that I need to 
I need to fix as well. I don't want to be you know, in 20 years time thinking back, I wish I could have seen one more game of cricket or one more not hockey match. And, um, and so it's, it's up to me to, to try and see how I get that right. To how, because you have to have, you have to have a, a business life, you have to have that and you have to have a family life. And to combine the two so that one day when your son eventually at 18 shakes your hand and gives you a hug and says goodbye because he leaves home, you know, he's one of your best friends. I've always been massively involved with youth and you know, my foundation is, is primarily focused on helping kids. I'd like to be a guy that people trust, that they can call and get advice from and, uh, and so I think that will grow to a large degree, especially within the rugby community with the players that I've had an influence over in the last couple of years. And so whatever I can do to help mentor as many young leaders as possible, um, certainly I think will be my small part to play in, in, in this country's evol evolving um, journey, I guess. I like surrounding myself with pe people who give energy rather than take it, and there's a very clear difference between those, and, you, and everyone you meet either takes it or, or delivers it. So I like energetic people, I like enthusiastic people, and uh, when I'm around them, I feel like I become more enthusiastic and I exude more energy. For me, it's, it's nice, to be, nice to be important, but it is more important to be nice. Uh, which, is, which is crucial for people uh, in, in, in positions of power.